Hello and welcome. Welcome to Crystal Bridges. My name is Marissa Reyes, and I'm the Chief Learning and Engagement Officer for Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. Thank you for joining us this evening as we explore the enduring impact of the legacy of the U.S. Constitution with our esteemed guests, former Secretary of State, U.S. Senator, and First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton and Dr. Angie Maxwell. Before we start our program, I'd like to begin with our Indigenous Peoples Acknowledgement. Recognizing the museum's role as settlers and guests in the Northwest Arkansas region. We acknowledge the Caddo, Quapaw, and Osage, as well as the many Indigenous take caretakers of this land and water. We appreciate the enduring influence of the vibrant, diverse, and contemporary cultures of indigenous peoples. We are conscious of the role in colonization that museums have played. As cultural institutions, we have a responsibility to engage in the dismantling of historical and systemic invisibility of indigenous peoples past, present, and future. We chose to intentionally, we choose to intentionally hold ourselves accountable to appropriate conversation, representation, connection, and education to facilitate a space of measurable change. Tonight's program is inspired by and builds on the ideas and themes in the exhibition titled, We the People, the Radical Notion of Democracy. In a once in a lifetime opportunity, a rare original print of the US Constitution, one of only seven known, one of only 11 known in the world is displayed alongside original prints of the Declaration of Independence, the proposed Bill of Rights, and the Articles of Confederation. Portraits of Native American leaders, including John Mathias's depiction of Seneca leader Red Jacket, hang beside familiar paintings of revolutionary leaders such as Alexander Hamilton by John Trumbull. Constitutional themes of equality, freedom, and justice are explored in 20th century works by Jacob Lawrence and Gordon Parks, among others, while living artists such as Roger Shimamura, Luis Garza, and Shelley Nero address past and present struggles for equality. This free exhibition, if you haven't seen it yet, remains open until January 2nd, 2023, and we invite you to visit us to witness history and to consider our present moment through the power of art with this unique exhibition. Tonight's program is made possible through the generous support of our sponsors and friends of Crystal Bridges. They're identified on the screen before you. I'd like to extend our gratitude, so please join me in thanking our exhibition and program sponsors. And thank you to Arkansas PBS for their partnership in making tonight's program accessible to those tuning in from home and remotely via live stream. We are grateful to have your support on this and other efforts supporting the exhibition and our mission. <clears throat> now, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, Dr. Angie Maxwell. Angie Maxwell holds the Diane Blair Endowed Chair in Southern Studies and is a professor of political science at the University of Arkansas, where she serves as the director of the Diane Blair Center of Southern Politics and Society. Dr. Maxwell is a Truman Scholar who received her PhD in American Studies from the University of Texas. She is the author of numerous nationally recognized publications, including the Long Southern Strategy, How Chasing White Voters in the South Changed American Politics, which was named the Times Higher Education Book of the Week, and The Indicted South, Public Criticism, Southern Inferior Inferiority, and the Politics of Whiteness, which won the V.O. Key Award for Best Book in Southern Politics, and the C. Human C. Hugh Holman Honorable Mention for Best Book in Southern Literary Criticism. So, Without further ado, I would like you to help me welcome Dr. Maxwell to the stage. Yeah. 
All right, we've got limited time, and I want to learn everything we can from our special guests. But I want to thank, thank you, Marissa. Um, Hillary Rodham Clinton has spent five decades in public service. Five decades. Law professor, groundbreaking attorney, First Lady of Arkansas, First Lady of the United States, United States Senator from New York, Secretary of State, candidate for president. She is responsible for providing health care to millions of children across this country. She fought tirelessly for the first responders who risked their lives at Ground Zero. She repositioned American diplomacy and development for the 21st century. She restored America's standing on the world stage. She stared down dictators. She championed public education. And she declared unequivocally that women's rights are human rights. We were lucky enough to have 18 years of her public service here in Arkansas. She arrived at the University of Arkansas School of Law in 1974, fresh off her work on the Watergate Committee, and she left in 1992 to move into the White House. During her tenure in Arkansas, she co-founded the Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families. She expanded you know, access to rural health care and she improved educational standards across the state. There is no doubt that we all still benefit from the good work that she did here. She told me once that the people of Arkansas were some of the hardest working she'd ever met that they were full of grace and grit. Many of you hard workers are in this room where tonight, thanks to the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, you get to hear a discussion of the most important document in American history, our Constitution, from one of the most important and consequential leaders in American history. What a night. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please help me welcome back to Northwest Arkansas the incomparable Hillary Rodham Clinton. It's so great to be here. I just have to acknowledge what an absolute joy it is for me to be here, be in Bentonville, be at Crystal Bridges, uh, one of the most amazing places in the world. And for that, I want to thank my longtime friend, Alice Walton, who's out there somewhere. There she is. Um, and you know, I know, Angie, we're going to talk about really serious things like the Constitution and we the people, but it is such a joy and the beauty of this place. The staff at Crystal Bridges um, have just um, put joy into my heart um, being able to see this finally for the first time. And I also have to say you were kind of talking about how I arrived in Fayetteville and a long time ago, 1974. Um, but there are actually some people here who have been my friends since then. And I am so grateful to see them and to be back with them. And of course, one who isn't here, Diane Blair, whose 
uh, center you are part of um, is someone who um, had such a great impact on my life. So personally, I just could not be happier to be back here, although I have to say I could barely recognize everything that's going on <laughs> in Benville. Chelsea and I were here when we were filming our series uh, about gutsy women, and we had a great you know, time coming in, we interviewed some of the Afghan refugees who are being made welcome here in Northwest Arkansas. Thank you all so much for that. And but it's just phenomenal to be back. So thank you, Dr. Maxwell, for uh, doing this event. I mean, it's the honor of a lifetime, right? <laughs> and there are some serious things, but you know, I'm a permanent student. I like to learn forever. And so this for me is an opportunity to ask someone with so much knowledge and experience about these important issues we're facing today. So we just went through this exhibit, um, We the People. And it was Ruth Bader, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg that said, you know, we have the oldest constitution in force in the world. And it starts with three little words, We the People. But we know a lot of groups had to fight to be part of that We the People. What groups do you think are still not being heard? And what are the obstacles they're facing? Well, first, I, I really want to congratulate um, the curators uh, for this exhibit, which if you haven't seen, I hope you will see, because the juxtaposition of these priceless uh, documents and the artwork, uh, painting, and sculpture that surround them, that continue to tell this story, uh, is just uh, phenomenal. And, and look, I mean, we are still in a debate in our country about what we the people actually means and who it includes. And then we have the, you know, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, we're still having arguments about that as well. I actually think the arguments and the debates are healthy uh, because we have seen since our founding, since uh, our Constitution uh, was uh, written and then adopted, um, a very uh, forceful push, a constant pressure to expand the meaning of we the people. And there's always been pushback against that. Those who have power do not give it up willingly. They have to be either persuaded or pushed aside. And we obviously fought a civil war about what we the people uh, meant. Uh, I think it's quite significant that Benton County was one of the counties that seceded from Arkansas when Arkansas seceded uh, from the Union. And there were about a thousand uh, men from Northwest Arkansas serving in the Union Army, and there was a lot of, you know, activity and military skirmishes and all kinds of, uh, you know, action up here because there were those who decided to secede because we the people should not include slaves. And there were others who said, I think we need to expand what we the people means. And you all know how that proceeded with amending our Constitution to give black men the vote, fighting and struggling to try to bring some element of equity to uh, the lives and fortunes of former slaves, the collapse of Reconstruction, the advent of Jim Crow, the continuing struggle for women's suffrage, which had not been included in the Constitution when it was amended uh, after the Civil War, finally getting women's suffrage, and then all kinds of efforts being uh, put in the way of we the people actually meaning what those three words say, and trying to prevent groups that were not in the majority, or even if they were in the majority, groups without power, economic power, from having political power, and the struggle continued. And we have, I think, in a quite miraculous way, 
um, kept pushing forward over lots and lots of obstacles about whether or not we could expand the meaning to include former slaves, freed blacks, women, people from all kinds of immigrant backgrounds. And we are still having that argument. Uh, and so when you, you ask about who's included and who's not included, it kind of depends upon where you live and who's in power and whether they want you to be in their definition of who the people are and whether they want you to be part of forming a more perfect union. So we have seen the kinds of pushback that uh, has resulted in all sorts of claims about elections that uh, were without basis in fact or evidence, but motivated by a deep fear of expanding we the people to include all of us. And to me, that is a inherent central struggle in the American journey. And sometimes we make progress and sometimes we go backwards and then we have to regroup and try to keep pushing forward again. Um, so it is not at all uh, clear as to in practice who we the people will be. Legally, constitutionally, we covered a lot of ground. We finally got around to giving Native Americans the vote, something that had been left out uh, with both black um, suffrage and women's suffrage. And we're still trying to prevent in places for African Americans to vote, Native Americans to vote, uh, people of Hispanic descent to vote, young people to vote, because people who want to hold on to power, or gain power, who are worried that groups that they are not part of might have a voice and a vote are trying to limit the definition of we the people. And that is absolutely apparent in the South, particularly after the Shelby County decision. Southern states that used to have to have redistricting and voting rules you know, looked at and approved by the courts suddenly didn't have to. And we haven't, Congress hasn't written a new formula to apply the Voting Rights Act, and now we see all of this same, you, have, you know, voter suppression happening all over again. Well, you well, know, I, I have to say I was in the Senate when we voted on the extension of the Voting Rights Act, which was first um, passed into law in 1965, and it was reauthorized periodically. And when I was in the Senate and George W. Bush was president, the House passed the extension overwhelmingly. In the Senate, we passed the extension 98 to nothing. Nobody voted against extending the Voting Rights Act, including what Dr. Maxwell is referring to, which is to continue to basically keep an eye on states that had a history of voter suppression and exclusion so that they wouldn't go backwards. Everybody voted for it. And then we got to the uh, appeals to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, oh, we don't need that anymore. This was after the Congress had decided we did need it and had passed it overwhelmingly and George W. Bush had signed it the Supreme Court says, no, just kidding, we don't need that. You guys are wrong. Mr. President, you're wrong. We're throwing out what are called pre-clearance requirements for states with a history of uh, voter um, suppression. And then it was like all bets were off. Everybody was like, oh, wow, well, let's see what we can figure out how to do to make it more difficult. And we've been really struggling with that ever since, in some places quite dramatically, uh, but not just in the South. There were places, you know, other places um, in, you know, the North, which made it very difficult to register to vote, which purged millions and millions of voters off the voting rolls, uh, even though they were more than alive and maybe hadn't voted for, you know, an election or two, but they were still where they said they were. It, it became a, a real 
example of you know sending a message that the court's going to you know basically just hope you do the right thing and sadly not everybody did and my students are always surprised by how little information there is about elections in the constitution how much is left to the states how differently they do it and redistricting also you know in arkansas this last cycle is the first time the Republican Party has been in control of redistricting since Reconstruction, and they split Little Rock into three congressional districts, and we only have four. And it seems to me that there should be more federal oversight to, for states' rules to kind of match. What do you think about that? <clears throat> well, I do think that that is um, uh, required now because, you know, look, redistricting, gerrymandering, States, whether they're in the North, the South, the East, the West, Democrat, Republican, they're going to try to go as far as they can to advantage themselves. But at the cost, increasingly, of any kind of sensible lines being drawn so that people feel disenfranchised because it doesn't make any sense to them and they don't understand why one city would be cut up into three pieces, for example. And there's a lot of uh, other uh, places you could point to that did that or worse. So I do think that there needs to be greater focus on trying to figure out how to better rationalize our election. Now you know, though, that there is a case before the Supreme Court that um, would go the absolute opposite direction and basically invest so much power in state legislatures if the court agrees with this argument that has been condemned by every legal scholar from the most liberal to the most conservative as having absolutely no basis. But, you know, you can't blame these guys for trying. They want to get as much as they can. And so they are basically telling the Supreme Court that because there's so much about uh, states controlling elections in the Constitution, that it should go so far as the state legislatures deciding who actually won, regardless of what the votes necessarily would be. So it's like what we saw on January 6th in 50 different settings. And as I said, I mean, one of the most well-known conservative judges, uh, a judge named Ludwig, who's been, who was on the bench for a long time and then uh, left it recently, has felt so strongly about this. He has written about it. He even submitted a brief to the uh, Supreme Court arguing passionately, and rightly, I would say, against the court doing this. But who knows what will happen next? And it's very troubling to see our elections, which have always been uh, viewed as the centerpiece of our exercise of democracy, being so targeted. And, you know, when I was Secretary of State, I would travel around the world encouraging people to have free and fair elections. We would send observers. The Carter Center under uh, former President Carter is really well known for sending observers um, to support people who just want a fair vote. They want people who are eligible to be able to vote and then they want those votes counted. I used to talk about that all the time. In fact, you know, part of the reason that uh, I'm not Vladimir Putin's best friend is um, <laughs> because when he decided, you know, I love the way he runs Russia. Uh, <laughs> It's, you know, it, it sadly is very attractive to some of the leaders we have in our country. Um, because when I was coming in as Secretary of State, he had decided he was not going to be president anymore. He's going to make uh, Dmitry Medvedev president. He'd be prime minister. And there were all kinds of theories about why would he do that. I don't know all the reasons. But then in the fall of 2011, he had a big announcement with... Uh, Medvedev standing beside them. They were both wearing black leather jackets, which, you know, I guess was some kind of metaphor. I don't know. And 
they made an announcement, and here was the announcement. I have decided to be president again. He will be prime minister. That was the announcement. So then they had an election to elect members of the Duma, their, their you know, parliamentary legislative body. And it was, just, it was, I mean, it was so blatant. There was so many videos of people literally stuffing ballot boxes, throwing ballots away. So I was Secretary of State, and I said, you know, the Russian people deserve to have a free and fair election where they get to choose their leaders. I mean, I don't think that was very controversial. <laughs> now, I, and at the same time, there were a lot of Russians who had the same view. And they poured into the streets in Moscow and St. Petersburg and a few other places, tens of thousands of people protesting this sham election. And Putin blamed me for causing their riot. And you know, I mean, the rest literally is history. Um, so <laughs> it's like, you know, what can you do, right? What you said about state legislators approving, you know, who wins elections, and that we've gone that far, right? I was thinking the thing that disturbs me the most and why it used to be that people thought it was so interesting when I told them I was a political scientist, and now they just go like, oh, I'm so sorry, right? <laughs> because none of the rules, you know, are there anymore. But seriously, about norms, and about so much of the way government works, is actually not codified in the Constitution. It is tradition and custom. And if someone wants to exploit that, they can. I mean, do you think some of those things, some of the checks and balances should be more codified in a way? Well, I, I didn't until... Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we've seen what's happened over the last several years. Um, you know, it's really a shame, and, and you have to laugh so you don't cry. Um, we, we've, we've always had leaders who, um, you know, cut corners, who may not have always done the right thing. Maybe they even, you know, skirted or, or went over the line on the law. I mean, that's, that's human nature. But our presidents, by and large, I think it's fair to say, when it came to the Constitution, when it came to the, the norms of how our system is supposed to work, and therefore how they are supposed to uh, be part of it, you know, we're by and large, um, you know, abiding by those, those norms. I mean, when um, the Supreme Court said that uh, George W. Bush was going to be uh, president, without counting the votes in Florida, and Al Gore had won the popular vote by 500,000, uh, he didn't say go to the streets and, and stop it from happening. Um, well, as a matter of fact, when I won the popular vote by 2.9 million votes, Just tell you, I could just tell you my personal, you know, experience. So obviously, um, it, it it was you know a very difficult time, and I gave my concession speech, and I said you have to give the president, the new president, uh, a chance, and that's part of the norms. Where actually, if you don't win in our crazy electoral college system, you know, like Al Gore, who gave a magnificent concession speech, I tried to say, okay, look, he's now going to be our president. And, you know, I did hope for the best. I really did. I, I thought, you know, the office itself has such an aura about it that I really believed that there had to be some impact on uh, behavior. And then I went to the inauguration. <laughs> and... That was another norm. I mean, if you think I wanted to go to the inauguration, <laughs> maybe not so much. And, but we were there, and I was sitting next to George W. Bush, and we were listening to this speech, because usually, I, you know, if you go back and look at inaugural speeches, you know, presidents 
in one way or another, they say, okay, we had a hard fought election, but now I wanna be the president of everybody. I wanna bring the country together. Well, we were hearing carnage in the streets and dark dystopian views about our country. And I was sitting there and thinking, what's happening? I mean, that is, that is beyond the norm. That is not, I mean, you could maybe say, I'm really proud of my supporters, I'm gonna do the best I can, but I want other people to join me. You can do something to kind of act like you are bringing the whole country together. Well, I wanna make sure I get to Dobbs. I mean, you warned us. We weren't surprised, I know you were not. But the way it all happened, you know, the leaked draft. I was shocked by the hostility in the draft. I was shocked by the historical inaccuracies in the draft. And I didn't, I did not expect it to just fly. It was always wrong. It's such an, uh, it's, it's such a shaming way to say things to women in this country. Um, how did you react when it looked? Well, again, when I, when I was in the Senate, um, I had the opportunity to interview as part of the confirmation process, uh, both uh, Justice Alito and uh, Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts. And I had very different reactions to them. I ended up voting against both of them. And I felt like with Justice Alito, he was always on a mission. It was not, it, you know, I, I felt like with Justice Roberts, he was, you know, he was a very polite, very uh, civil, engaging person in conversation. And, you know, I haven't seen a lot of them, a lot of him, but when we went to um, uh, Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, lying in, in state at the Supreme Court, uh, Bill and I, you know, talked with, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, and you, even if you disagree with him, which on a lot of issues I do, like the voting rights bill, um, I, I, did, I felt like he was struggling. He was trying to figure out how to do what he thought he should do and what he wanted to do, but to be aware of and uh, at least acknowledging other perspectives. I didn't feel that way with Alito at all. And I, I think he, um, he wrote an opinion, when I read it in the leaked version, I, I thought to my days uh, teaching at the, the law school at Fayetteville, I would have flunked whoever had turned it in. <laughs> it was ahistorical, it was poorly written and reasoned, it, it was a screed. And talk about a results-oriented outcome, there was like, no way, no, nothing to hang it onto that you could look to for precedent. Um, and so I don't know why it was leaked. I don't know who leaked it, but I thought it was a very um, badly argued, badly reasoned opinion. And I thought, okay, well, maybe they want to get to that result, but maybe whoever leaked it wants them at least to write an opinion that doesn't come across like a screed. Well, the final opinion is basically the same. And it is, you know, troubling to me um, that the court uh, took that uh, position obliterating basically the right to privacy. Uh, because the right to privacy, yeah, it's not mentioned in the Constitution, but, you know, neither are AR-15s. And so, you know, God, you know, you look at, You, you look at how the law evolves and how society evolves. And the Dobbs decision is trying to literally turn the clock back more than 50 years because you've got to go all the way back to a decision called Griswold versus Connecticut. I'm a recovering lawyer, so I can't help myself. But <laughs> it was the decision which said that you could not criminalize the use of contraceptives by married heterosexual couples. And 
it was really rooted in the idea that if we're going to have, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and we have a Bill of Rights that presumes certain freedoms and autonomy for individuals, then decisions like that are certainly within the private realm of marriage. And therefore, there is a, a right that people have to be protected in the most intimate of their decision making from government intrusion. Now, if you look at the right to privacy underlying the Oberfall decision about gay marriage, um, you could see why the Congress, including Republicans, voted yesterday to enshrine <laughs> to enshrine a right to marriage, both same-sex marriage and interracial marriage in federal law. But here's the kicker. You get federal protection by that law, but not state protection. And so if you look at the Dobbs decision and you look at Clarence Thomas's concurrence, they can still go down the road to say, okay, you have federal protections if you are in a state that recognizes gay marriage. But no state will be, by that law, required to uh, recognize and permit gay marriage. So this, this argument and, and this cultural struggle that the court has decided to throw itself into uh, is nowhere near done. And I think the Dobbs decision has been repudiated in every election where it has appeared on a ballot since Kansas. And in candidate, <laughs> go Jayhawks, go. Um, <laughs> And, and it has also been repudiated in a lot of the midterm elections where a candidate was rabidly, positively uh, anti-choice and the opponent was not. So we are in, so as, as comforting as it is to see what the Congress did yesterday on a bipartisan vote in both houses, um, it's not over. Because the thing that you have to understand about a lot of the opposition to what really are big social, cultural movements rooted in privacy and autonomy and individual decision making run counter to the kind of world that a number of people, including right now, um, at least four, maybe five members of the Supreme Court want to see. So this is a very complicated legal situation, which I think has to be dealt with politically. So that's why what happened in Kansas, what happened in Montana, what happened in Kentucky, what happened, not surprisingly, in California, that's why people standing up and saying, wait a minute, you know, the idea that you can exercise your bodily autonomy and make the most intimate private decisions for yourself has to be defended. And you can have variations on it, and there can be exceptions and, and, and all kinds of rulings, but it's, it's going to be at the heart of political campaigning and organizing for you know, the next several years at least. And the final thing I would say on this is it's really sad to me that the best modern example we have of what happens when you have a complete uh, ban on abortion for all reasons is what, re what the recent history of Ireland shows us. It was an absolute ban. If you were well enough off, you'd go somewhere else, England, Europe, somewhere else, if you were seeking uh, reproductive health care. Unless 
you were having a miscarriage and you couldn't travel. And what happened in Ireland is that a doctor, a woman who'd been recruited to be a doctor in Ireland from, I think, India, um, had a wanted pregnancy, had a, was having a miscarriage. She knew enough to know that she was having a serious uh, problem. She goes to the hospital and basically um, she knows what needs to be done, which is that the baby is, is dying and the baby's dying is killing her. And she says to the doctors, you know, and she's in no condition to get up and go somewhere else. She says, you have to help me. And they basically say, no, we can't. She dies. That's what triggered the referendum in Ireland making abortion legal. And I think it's incredibly profoundly sad that it's going to probably happen in this country. And we've already seen people, women having to go across state lines and women having to seek out help, you know, for medical problems that would not be treated in their own uh, states. So we, we have to stay very focused on this issue because it's like a canary in the coal mine issue about everything else. It's, it feels like it's two Americas. It feels like it used to be when you know, the Bill of Rights only really affected your federal citizenship. And if you lived in a state that didn't have those same protections, you know, one citizenship you know, was skimpy, to say the least. Um, and it's starting to feel that way, again, on gun control, on abortion access, on right to work. Um, that, you know, people in some states have a lot more rights than people in other states. Well, and I don't know what the solution is, but yeah. it feels familiar it and does. not in a, in a backsliding way. Well, look, I, I think your, your description is right that um, there is a lot of um, uh, difference between states now and most likely there will be even greater difference in some places going forward. Um, and it's not clear to me exactly um, what that's going to mean, because it won't mean the same thing for every place, I don't think. So for example, um, I, I, I think that there are people who are going to be choosing where to go to medical school based on where they can get a full education and everything, including you know, reproductive health care. There are young women who are going to be deciding where to go to college based on things like that. There are going to be businesses that employ a lot of women who are going to be thinking about that. So I'm not sure how this plays out in real life, everyday ways so that people are voting with their feet, so to speak, by where they're going to live or, or not. Um, but I, you will see some of that. But a lot of this is going to have to be dealt with in the political arena. People are going to have to decide whether they can take a lot of this on. And some of it will be circumstantial, like if, somebody, if a woman dies because she can't get medical care because doctors are afraid to, to treat her to the highest standards of uh, the medical profession because of the laws in their states, you know, that will have an impact. And, we're, and we have to figure out how to look at this as the intensely personal battle it is, but not leave it to individuals to try to fight it out. We have to have, you know, uh, organized efforts, as you saw, as I said, in Kansas and elsewhere. So I, I'm, I think it's a little soon to try to figure out exactly everything that's going to play out, but um, I do think that some states will, in effect, see impacts on their economy, their education systems, because of you know the laws that they have. You know, in Arkansas, we went from solidly Democrat 
one cycle, 2012, of somewhat parity between the two parties in the legislature, two, supermajority Republican. Because of that, we don't have a history of parties working together. We have no history of a lot of competition at those local races, which deflates turnout, which affects all of these things. What, what would you say to a Democrat in Arkansas about running in a race that's a real uphill battle? I mean, it's really hard to get good people to make that kind of sacrifice, but it's the only thing that's going to bring healthy two-party competition to the state. Well, you know, as, as you might expect me to say, I would, I would urge people uh, not to um, avoid the political process because it's hard. Um, I can't predict what races and what places are potential, potentially winnable, but I can absolutely say with certainty, if you don't try, you know it's not. And there are some good examples now around the country of people really organizing and being focused, hyper-focused on local issues and making a case that is able to sort of turn the tide, not everywhere, but somewhere. Um, you know, it is, it's, it's very um, surprising to see how um, so many states, not just Arkansas, but I know this one probably the best, has, has moved in you know, one direction so dramatically. Um, but I, as I said, I don't think any political defeats or victories are permanent. They become permanent if you don't contest them, if you don't speak out, if you don't make a case, if you don't try to be part of a smart, effective opposition. Uh, and if you don't also pay attention to what the people you'd like to represent are interested in. I mean, you can't, you, you, if you're going to be a Democrat in Arkansas, that's not the same as being a Democrat in Brooklyn. And so you've got to be honest about that. And you've got to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish. And basically, you're trying to create an environment that maximizes everybody's potential to start a business, to start a family, to make a difference in their community. You want to provide those basic tools. And, you know, I, I, I think a lot of our arguing in politics is so on the margins. You know, it's on stuff that is not that significant to a majority of the people. So you've got to zero in on what's important to the people you want to represent. And, you know, I've got some longtime friends here who've been in and out of politics for 50 years. And, you know, they didn't do it by going on Twitter and trying to figure out how to get clicks. They did it by <laughs> being involved with their communities and getting to know people and listening to them and then coming up with ideas that would make their communities stronger. So it, it, there's no easy answer. And believe me, it's not. You know, it's not for the faint-hearted. Um, it's a contact sport, and it is difficult. Um, but if you believe that you can make a difference and that you can help people, which has always been, you know, what I find most motivating about being in public life, then you got to start somewhere. And you start by building those relationships, because at the end of the day, it's relationships that will hold you up when they start attacking you and, you know, making all kinds of crazy, you know, claims about you. You know, I've got a good friend here with me, uh, M.K. Pritzker, whose husband was just reelected governor of Illinois. And, you know, he just went out and did crazy things in Illinois, like balance the budget. I mean, <laughs> fix the pension system, you know. and. He didn't get like all wrapped around the axle about every, you know, wild idea that somebody was throwing out into the world, but just got down and did the work. And I'm very old fashioned, but I do think doing the work counts and being able to produce results counts. Um, so you have to be able to get in the arena and, you know, test it out. And you still may not win. Uh, but maybe slowly but surely people will see there's an alternative because it, when you have one party rule, watch out, 
you know, that never works for long. And so there's going to be, I think, a lot of questions that will eventually arise about how, you know, the legislature is behaving or what they're doing or why they're doing what they're doing. And you can get people to, you know, listen and pay attention. The, the first class I taught at the university, I taught with David Pryor. And he always said, casework, casework, casework. Never lose touch with the people, know the people, serve the people. And that is the only thing that will make you electable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do people do that in this day and age with all of the disinformation, with all of the, you know, I, I, I look at it because I study it. And I have family members who, you know, have been convinced by things. Um, and it's really hard to cut through that noise. Yeah. Well, I think you've put your, you know, your finger on one of the biggest problems that we're facing as a democracy, um, and that is where on earth do you get accurate information? Um, where do you find um, a place that you can trust is giving you news based on, you know, facts, evidence, and uh, the truth, the best you can determine it? And, and there's no easy answer to that. I learned a lot of lessons that I did not have any idea that I would be learning from the 2016 campaign because honestly, I did not know what was happening online until it was too late. And all of a sudden, I mean, I knew that, you know, people were saying crazy things about a pizza parlor, uh, you know. <laughs> And I would have friends who, literally I went to elementary and high school with, who would be canvassing for me in different parts of the country, like Pennsylvania or somewhere like that. And they would knock on somebody's door and they'd say they you know, were um, supporting me and asking for their vote. And the people say, oh, I can't vote for her. You know, she traffics children in the basement of a pizza parlor. <laughs> and, and my friends would go like, no, that's not true. <laughs> And, and, you know, people say, oh, no, no, I saw it on the Internet. I saw it on the Internet. And so then we'd say, there is no basement in this pizza parlor. And, but, <laughs> but look what happened. A guy in North Carolina online read that, got his assault weapon, got in his car, drove to Washington, D.C., to this little restaurant I've never even been in called Comet Pizza because he was going to liberate the children in the basement. And he walks in there, and you've got, in the middle of the day, you've got young moms with their toddlers having a slice of pizza, and he's got an assault weapon, which he fires, and thankfully nobody gets hurt, because he believed what he read on the Internet, which was designed to convince him and others who encountered that information about a big lie. And so we know the big lie works. If you repeat it enough, and social media is the big lie on steroids if you're selling a big lie. And so we have to do a lot more to fight back however we can. Uh, we're all on notice now. Nobody should be surprised. And it's, and it's something that is sadly um, being used, not just politically, but now I think economically, where you know, people are going after their competitors' businesses, they're putting in false reviews, they're making false claims. So this is, this is yes, political, obviously, but it's more than that. Because if you live in a world of disinformation and you have no idea who to believe or who to trust, by definition, a democracy can't work because a democracy requires at least a minimum of discussion, debate, listening to one another, and maybe trying to reach principled compromise to get something accomplished. Um, so I spent a lot of time you know, looking at disinformation and trying to figure out what can be done about it because it's, it's a dagger at the heart of democracy and 
Sadly, it's a device that has already been shown to be manipulated by foreign adversaries. You know, the interference in our elections was not made up. Uh, it actually happened, and it was a highly organized, highly focused effort to get people to believe things that weren't true. And it didn't just happen in 2016, it happened um, additionally. And I'll give you a quick story. So after 2016, the current president of France was running for president for the first time in France. And they saw what happened in 2016 and, and his campaign called my campaign and they said, you know, we're, we're getting signs that they're gonna try to, you know, do the same thing on us. Emails that aren't true, emails that are made to be crazy like the pizza parlor thing and all the rest of it. And so we sent people over to talk with their campaign and they had, a, they had an advance notice because they saw what happened to me. And so they began to seed their email accounts with their own traps and they had enough time to do that. And then they had a real break because in France, there is no news coverage of an election 72 hours before the election. So basically, if the election's on Sunday, news coverage stops Friday. But some of the foreigners, including frankly Americans, who were you know, working with others to try to defeat Macron and elect Le Pen, whose party had been funded by Putin, I mean, more than you wanna know, they didn't know about the law in France. So they began unleashing all their bots and their trolls on Friday in order to influence the election, but it wasn't covered. <laughs> and it didn't have the impact that it would have had otherwise. So there are things that we have to think about doing in the greater need of protecting democracy that I think would help us limit the impact of disinformation. And, and finally, when you said about people in your family and all of that, I mean, we have to understand better how to deprogram people who believe the stuff they find going down these rabbit holes. Um, um, you know, there, there have been some fascinating academic um, research about how the algorithms operate to entrap people further and further into conspiracies. And there was one case I read, I think it was a study out of Duke maybe, or UNC Chapel Hill, I can't remember. But so a, a young mother goes online and is looking for sites of other young mothers to talk about healthy, baby food. I mean, how do you make your own healthy, quote, organic baby food, right? And she gets on, you know, she's directed to a site, she's on the site, and then they direct her to another site. And then pretty soon she's on an anti-vax site. And then pretty soon she's down further into the, the, the pit of uh, the rabbit hole where, you know, people are making all kinds of claims about, you know, vaccines and, you know, children being trafficked and murdered and all this stuff. And it literally took like an hour to get there. It's not what she started out looking for. But once you get into that, I mean, every one of us is addicted one way or the other and the algorithms keep us addicted. And how do we kind of figure out how to break that addiction? And I've always found it really interesting that a lot of the people who run the big tech companies, including the social media companies, when they hire nannies for their children, in the contracts are provisions that the children cannot have phones and cannot have screen time without adult supervision. So think about, I mean, these are the people who make those algorithms that entrap the minds of children, particularly teenagers and lots of adults who end up believing stuff that is totally um, made up and dangerous. So we got to figure out how to do a better job on that. We've got time for one final question, so I'm just going to ask the big one. <laughs> Will democracy survive? 
absolutely, yes, now, right? Yes, you know, I, I think we saw a pretty good example of, uh, some good examples of that in this midterm election in lots of places. And it, and it, it didn't happen by accident. People were willing to run. People are, were willing to stand up and speak out. Even people running, you know, uh, in Republican districts were, you know, willing to say, yeah, the election was not stolen. Joe Biden's actually the president. You know, we saw some, some beginnings of people standing up and speaking out. I mean, we saw that little glimmer of fact-based reality coming into focus. And so I felt, I, I was deeply relieved um, about a lot of the outcomes. And, you know, my late wonderful friend and, and predecessor, um, Secretary Madeleine Albright, who, you know, she was, yes, please give, give Madeleine a round of applause. And, she said something that, you know, I just have always thought was so accurate because here's somebody who, you know, first she fled from the Nazis with her family out of Czechos what was then Czechoslovakia. Then they return after World War II. Then they have to flee from, you know, the Soviets and the communists. And, you know, she, she was someone who'd experienced what freedom meant, what democracy meant. She was the most extraordinary patriot, uh, she remembered so vividly seeing the Statue of Liberty as a little girl going into New York Harbor when they were seeking refugee status in the United States. And so when people toward the end of her life, because she wrote a book about fascism, which is excellent, so she was certainly aware of some of our challenges. But when people used to ask her, well, Secretary Albright, are you an optimist or a pessimist? She would say, I am an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.